Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the True Life Podcast. I hope everybody's having a beautiful day. I hope the sun is shining, the birds are singing. I hope you realize how lucky you are to have some people in your life that love you. And I hope you realize how lucky I am to have everybody here with me today. I've got a great show for you today. The one and only, the Reverend Dr. Jessica Rochester. For those who may not know, she is an ordained interfaith minister with a doctorate in divinity, a transpersonal educator. She trained in the work of Dr. Roberto Asagioli and trained with Dr. Stanislav Grof from 1986 to 2018. She's been a workshop leader, a teacher, and in private practice. She continues to lecture on consciousness, non-ordinary states of consciousness, self-discovery, spiritual development, and personal transformation. She is the madrina and president of the Sioux de Montreal, a Santo Daime church that she founded in 1997 in Montreal, Canada. From 2001 to 2017, she worked with Health Canada to achieve the recognition of the Santo Daime as a legitimate religion and the right to import the Santo Daime sacrament for ritual use. In June 2017, this mission was accomplished and Sue de Montreal received an exemption to import and serve the Santo Daime Sacrament. She's on a mission to inspire and empower those who seek the adventure of self-discovery, those who hope to awaken consciousness, to rediscover authenticity, to find meaning in everyday life, and cultivate deep connections with oneself and others and with nature. Self-mastery is a psycho-spiritual journey of self-realization that requires good maps to guide the way and courage, faith, and willpower to navigate life's various challenges. It is possible to achieve and maintain greater health and well-being on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, creative, and spiritual by working with the principles of self-care, self-awareness, self-love, self-respect, and self-responsibility. Her work is dedicated to providing the maps and tools to facilitate personal growth and transformation. Awakening to the knowledge of our own true self, we can choose to live with consciousness, wisdom, and kindness. And her books, Ayahuasca Awakening, are these maps. And if you've been following our series, we have really got into some incredible information that has been profound for me and I think most of the listeners. Reverend Dr. Jessica, thank you for being here today. How are you? Well, did you read my whole website? <laughs> <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was really funny. What an introduction. It's it's always a joy to hang out with you and talk about things that are close to our heart. And above and beyond that, that are, you know, on the frontier of what's happening in, in this, you know, some people are calling it an awakening. Some people are calling it a renaissance. Some people are calling it whatever, a new age, you know. Those of us who are a little older, we've been around this block <laughs> okay, a few times. And a lot of things are recognizable as, uh-oh, that happened last time. Okay, oh, and it happened the time before. So can we watch out? Can we take care? Can we pay attention? Can we learn from the, from the things that happened in the past that didn't work out well? And can we do our very best to try and make sure that, that what's happening in this field of entheogens and psychedelics is done with responsibility, accountability, ethics, transparency, diversity, inclusivity, equity, you know, all these words that have deep, deep meanings and powerful importance and just need to be discussed. We need to have these open conversations about them because what gets in the way is what um, a colleague of mine from years ago who was um, a very brilliant astrologer, actually, and I, I, I say, you know, astrology, i I know that there's a wide range in the field of astrology of the very serious who are very careful what they say and how they conduct how they conduct their work to the you know right out there yeah. <laughs> and like every field you got to pay attention to what you're doing and who you're talking with right and and you know this person's take on things is is that all of us have our little demons okay and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a few of those today because we, we were talking about, you know, power recently and certainly um, the use and misuse. We, we've opened the conversation back um, about ethics and responsibility and accountability. And then there's some things that people don't particularly like talking about. OK, and so we're going to do our very best to try and talk about those things in a way that people can hear them. 
okay? Because often these things are discussed in a way that it's not so easy to hear or to listen or to understand and, and walls go up and, mm. and reactions happen, okay? So if we use a little humor, you know, and and a little lightness and some understanding and patience, then often it goes a little bit easier. Would you agree? Yeah. I would, I would definitely agree. So it, 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 this colleague of mine, he would say, you know, everybody wants to come in and, and they want to have a reading and they always want to hear the marvelous stuff, right? And he says, I have to feel around the edges, you know, about how wonderful they are and how marvelous their life is going to be. And today's going to be the best day. And, they're, you know, that, that's, you know, and he says, and then you have the people who come in and they say, help me understand the challenges. Help me understand what's difficult in my life. And don't just tell me the good things about what's in my chart, you know, but tell me the challenges and the difficult things and and the things that are just not in my chart but things that might be in me mm -hmm. that might be the very thing that that thing in my chart is going to bring me up against okay so you're going to find kind of more the cosmology astrologers and the archetypal astrologers are going to use this kind of language rather than the you know, everything's fine in rainbow land today, <laughs> astrologers, right? And so he would talk about, he'd say, can we call them just little demons? Okay, the things that everybody, you know, I've referred to them as personality glitches and, you know, flaws, personality flaws and our baggage and, you know, all of these different words that we can use to help the medicine go down, all right? And so... You know, this is a, a kind of a language that we have to find the best words. We have to find the best words because these are difficult things to talk about. And so let's jump right out with saying we all have character flaws. Right. Right. We all have glitches in our personalities. We all have little bits, little, you know, <laughs> the, the kind of the little demons. Okay. That and 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 however they got there, whether they're just part of our personality in this lifetime, because we are all, you know, we all arrive on planet Earth and we have our strengths and we have our shortcomings. And I believe that it's not our task in life to hide our shortcomings because that doesn't really work very well. <laughs> Right? That's the Wizard of Oz. All you need yeah. to do is lift the curtain. Okay, that's the emperor with no clothing, right? And so if we, the people around us who love us, they're usually the people who know our flaws best, who can see our little demons at work and our little flaws and our uh, all our, you know, our baggage in action and our, our faulty beliefs and all those things that, you know, personal work and, and transformation is about. So what are we on board right are yeah still, absolutely I'm with you. so yeah. what happens when you take when you take a situation where your situations such as we have today with this psychedelic and theogen renaissance um where you have people who may not have addressed who, who may not be in a situation to um you know, as like a supervised apprentice, you know, in the heritage traditions, we talk about apprenticeship. And I've said it so many times, people might think, oh, I'm not saying that again. But anyway, I was 14 years in my apprenticeship. And that does not count my transpersonal trainings. That does not count my interfaith minister, ministry trainings, my doctorate. And none of that is counted. That's 14 years. All of the other stuff is you know, added in on that 14 years of apprenticeship in the Santo Daniel before our church went independent. And so that's kind of the essential, the same way you want to be a psychiatrist, that's okay, but guess what? You have to go to medical school. You want to be a dentist, you have to go to dental school. You want to be an accountant, hang out your shingle, that's great. But you know what? You do have to have a degree in accounting before you can do anybody else's books. So Host George, I need you to explain to me why there are so many people in this field of psychedelics and entheogens who feel that they need no supervision, no training, no apprenticeship. But they've had a couple of marvelous experiences, and now they think that everybody should be having the same marvelous experiences, but because they don't have the maps and they only have their experience, what's happening? 
What I think. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What? Put, please I, put your thoughts out. I think. I think what's happening is that people have a fundamental transformation of their life, and they want other people to experience it. And a lot of the times, when you know, there's the Dunning Kruger effect, like the 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 less you know, the more you think you know. So the, mm -hmm. you know, my my mentor used to say, "The emptiest barrel makes the loudest sound," and it's not necessarily coming from a place of 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 um. It's not coming from a place of anger or, or maliciousness. It's coming from a place of ignorance. Like I want to help and I can help because I had this experience and you don't okay. realize. Yeah. So let's start ticking them off. Okay. We talked a little bit around this in our last session. Okay. The first one is good intentions. Yes. Good intentions. It's like, wow, I love this. And this really helped me. And so we can see this isn't, that doesn't have anything to do with psychedelics and entheogens. Somebody might discover a nutritional supplement. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they become like the advocate for this nutritional something. I took fill in the blank, okay, that wraps up your fill in the blank, okay. And I feel fabulous. Therefore, everybody should be taking this product or doing this exercise or go to that retreat or take up this practice. Okay, so there's like enthusiastic good intentions. Yeah, okay, well, that's up there. Next. The next one would be, a feeling of of power, I think, like the idea that they were over to overcome something, or perhaps they have power over somebody else, and that can be intoxicating. Yes. Okay. This is <laughs> exactly. This is where we start to range into the interesting side of where people have to make a decision. Okay, mm. the, the good intentions is like, oh, wow, I really love doing this. this maybe I better go and do some training in it. You know, I remember, okay, and I'm going to use, I'm not sure if I've ever discussed this example. If I have, forgive me, okay, any of you listening. Um, but I, I don't know how far back am I going into the late 80s, okay? And I was just fascinated with all of these you know, remember I came from the ashram and meditation yoga, know, so I was already, you know, deeply, you know, committed to my, how it was transformative for me. And I was, you know, advising, I wasn't teaching any of that, so I'm trained in it, but I was advising all my clients, you know, take up one of these, try Tai Chi or breathing exercises and what have you. And I made this little, based on everything that's up, I made this little relaxation tape for my clients. It was just me talking about the light and relaxing and breathing and, loving imagery and stuff like that and it's it was just starting to be done and you know i had i give all my clients copy this tape it took me years to figure out that other people were taking that and then copywriting it and <laughs> selling it okay yeah 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 it's a very interesting thing okay i was the first person in the year late 80s who was doing all of this and i had a client come in and she says you know something very bizarre happened to me when i was listening to your tape she's like i loved your tape and she says i would sometimes fall asleep listening to it and, um, you know, it was so relaxing and I breathe and relax my arms and I like, but, you know, just progressive relaxation. Okay. Who knew at that point, I didn't know that this could take people into very serious, non-ordinary states of consciousness and people could start having really profound experiences with it. So, you know, innocent me who thinks that, you know, I'm doing this wonderful thing, helping my clients relax. And so this one client said, I had this very bizarre experience. And I said to her, okay, describe it. And, and, and like, it was a profound experience in which she felt she entered into a past life. And so two things happened to me in that moment. Okay. The first thing was, is how can I help this, my client integrate this and talk about this and look into this in, in a way that will help her understand it. So that was the first thought. And the second thought, which was like in a big booming voice inside me, was, "You need more skills and training in this, kiddo. <laughs> okay, if you get your butt out into and get some some training in this, so that you have what you need when this happens." Now, I'm the kind of person that takes that really seriously, so that's what I did. You know, now, and and an and interesting end to that story, by the way was for those of you who are interested in you know past life experience and are they real or are they not real and all that jazz is the client actually got a flash of um what the client was experiencing was being shot down in in a small plane 
being shot down and dying in a, you know a war situation okay and so I, I could help her go through the grieving i could help her go through you know i'd done enough work in the <laughs> kubla ross field and stephen levine field that i could that i could offer was grieving it and finding a way of honoring it and she said she says the strange thing is i got a name and then guess what my client followed it up and found out that that person died when they were shot down in, the in a plane in the second world war. Isn't that interesting? Fascinating. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, we look at, do we have, you know, we talked about good intentions. I had really good intentions, hmm. okay? And, and I came to the realization that, uh-oh, <laughs> there's stuff here that's happening that's out of my maps and it's out of my personal experience and it's out of you know my knowledge base and so you need to have you need to be able to recognize that that's the choosing moment is recognizing uh oh okay i there's stuff here i need to learn i need to understand i need to look at and, and that's that's the choosing moment you know now, lots of people choose not to. It's like, oh, what do I need that for? You know, and, and, and what part of our little character flaw is up in operation then? And it's usually our ego that likes to think that we don't need training and we don't need supervision and we know it all. And we can call that narcissism or ego or anything we want, but it's still the same thing. You know, the rose is a rose and a tomato is a tomato. So we have then kind of a willful ignorance. Mm. Willful ignorance is vastly different from good intentions. So there's a willful ignorance. In other words, I kind of know, but I don't really want to know, or I want to think I know, or I want to pretend that I know, or I don't need that stuff. People shouldn't be telling me what I should be doing. You know, whether it's um, whether it's the government, the government shouldn't be telling me what I have to do. I should be able to do what I want without associations and organizations and governments telling me because I know better, because I'm connected to spirit, because I said, I'll give you another, do you want another yeah, funny example? Please, okay. I've got stories on the stories on the stories. Okay. So how this can kind of get really out of whack in non-ordinary states is many, many years ago. And it is many, many years ago. Okay. We had somebody who came in and joined our church, our church and, and they ha had this vibration in them. Okay. And then in a certain moment in, in, in a work, somebody put a drum in front of them and said, it looks like you're trying to drum, you know, or towards the end of the work or after a work. And it's like, oh, yes, drumming. That's what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm drumming and I'm drumming and, you know, spirits showing me how to drum and I'm drumming. Okay, and it's like, okay, that's yeah, fine. You want to kind of learn to drum, but we have musicians' practices and hymn practices. And if you're going to play a musical instrument, then you might have to make sure that you're all using the same sheet music and you're all following the same tune and you're all in the same rhythm. And we had a marvelous musician for a number of years. Uh, and he 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 insisted that we all practice with a metronome, you know, the TikTok, okay, so that we really would get very accurate, so we really could kind of hold the music well. So we've had lots of musicians come and go. Anyway, this particular musician, here you go with good intentions that slide past that. Uh oh, maybe I don't quite know what I'm doing here. Okay, just slid back past that into I know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> This person didn't come to him practice, didn't take any drum lessons, and insisted that we were all in our head, in our mind. And she was the only person who was drumming according to spirit. You know, the, the daimi had shown her to drum, and that she was drumming in spirit, and all the rest of us were off. Mm. Because we were in our minds with our printed up music. Okay, okay where do you go with that? What's that? What is that about? Hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of what can happen when people get to the, I don't need, I already know. I'm, and so, you know, it, it can be called a narcissistic bubble. Right. It's like a bubble, you know, it really is a kind of an energetic bubble because you try to kind of get in, it's kind of a barrier, yeah. you know, you can't kind of, 
penetrate past it to actually get in, to have the person listen because there will be anger and defensiveness. So that's a willful ignorance where somebody kind of sort of knows maybe, but they're really strongly holding on the willfulness of it. Okay. And so if we look at how is that playing out? Did you want us to add something? You had a thing on well, your face going on. Yeah. It tells me that mm, you can I always see. Is that, it seems to me like that is an archetype or a character in which you can see those same type of bubbles forming probably without the medicine. That person probably has a history of that type of behavior. Is, have, yes. is that accurate? Yeah, 100% accurate. Is is all that, you know, antigens and psychedelics, you know, and I'm really, I'm from the antigen field, right. sacred plants and you know, I bow to all of those who are working in research and science and, 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 you know, they, they know they have my support and I am available if I can ever assist in some way. And I don't pretend to have deep knowledge on that because I don't, you know, I don't use those substances. So um, I'm, I, I can only talk about what I know with any voice of experience, you know. So I can 100% affirm that with sacred plants, they are like amplifiers. You already have a narcissistic bubble. It's going to show you your narcissistic bubble. And you're either going to fight it or, and if and depending on, there's some people, they come in and it's like the narcissistic bubble expands. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been a big question that no one's been able to answer for me, which is, we're taking these substances that expand our consciousness. When I, when in, in our practice, when we drink daimi, it's we're shown, we're shown, we're shown our flaws. You know, we're shown where we're shown the highest and the best of the possibilities. We're shown our qualities and our strengths, but trust me, the daimi has no problem showing us our, our, our weaknesses, our shortcomings, our fears, that it is done from a place of grace. It is done from a place of support. It's done from a place of deep understanding that when we have these things, they cause suffering for us and probably suffering for others. So if we're being arrogant somewhere, that in the end, that arrogance will hurt us. And so that's the place that the teachings usually come from. And I ask myself when I see some of the things that happen, it's like, why isn't the tiny showing them that? <laughs> <laughs> like, mm -hmm. This person's taking not just, you know, in our in our in our line, but taking sacred plants and and they've got that going on for them. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what actually is happening? It's such a fascinating study. Um, you know, Joel Evans, are you listening? Yeah. Could you do some research on this, please? Okay, is what's happening there? You know, I'd love them. A master's student who's looking for a thesis topic or a doctoral student is, hey, could we look at what happens there, right there, in what I'm calling the choosing place, when we're being shown things, like what actually happens? Now, I know sometimes, you know, people are shown to that throughout the years we've had, you know, many people come in and they have this you know, maybe their first experience or the second or third, and it's all wonderful and it's a bliss and oh, it's so beautiful and I see, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then the daimi shows them something they don't want to see. And they're gone. <laughs> okay, they're gone. They don't come back. Now, that's really, really common. They just don't come back. It's just scary. They don't want to see that. They're going to pretend they didn't see it. They're not ready to face it, whatever it is. So we just send light and good wishes and and because we all understand how scary it can be to see things about ourselves and about the reality of life. And everybody has to be ready and willing to face it. You can't make somebody face it. Life is going to do that all by itself, you know. So that choosing place, you know, and then I've had plenty of people come in and they take Daini and then they'll come afterwards at some point to me and they'll say, I can't come back. Okay. Well, because the daimi said, listen, and then they show me, you have to choose now. You can't keep coming here. You can't keep coming here with this. You now have to choose. You either commit and dedicate to the spiritual path or you go. 
And that's really serious, you know. And so again, sometimes people step up and say, okay, ready to commit, you know. And other people go, yeah, <laughs> why would I go, <laughs> oh, they're gone, you know. Again, lots of light, lots of good wishes. Everybody has to find their own way. No. Did you have something you wanted to say? You got that expression on your face again. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out, like, I, I don't thoroughly understand what the, you can't, like you said, you can't make somebody change and, and it has to be a choice. It has to be a personal decision to want to be better. And if someone hasn't chosen to do that, maybe there's no substance or, or guidance that can, that can do that for them. And maybe that's what that big bubble is, is like they have such a strong resistance. Maybe such the trauma was so great for them that happened to them or the generational trauma that they're just not ready to change. What, whatever, we're going to come back to talking about that. Please don't yeah. let us know. I want to tell the Stan Groff story and Please. since it's shared openly in probably Christina Groff's book, The Thirst for Wholeness, and mm -hmm. certainly it's been shared. So I'm not I'm not at all disclosing anything confidential. She's passed anyway, but still, I, I know it's an open story, okay? Um, how she met Stan Groff was um, that she got into kind of a spiritual emergency, okay? And she happened to be a student of Joseph Campbell, and so she tried mm -hmm. to explain what was going on for her. Uh, to Joseph Campbell, and Joseph Campbell shook his head and he said, I only know one person who might be able to help you, and that's Stanislav Groff. Okay, and the big players all know each other. And so, I would have loved to have been a yeah, student of Joseph Campbell. You know, I'm a student of his work, I sure. would have loved to have been a student of him, of his, and, and the person. So, so she found out where he was and he was going to be whatever at Esalen or whatever he was doing. So, she troops off, and then you know. And, and then they fall in love and, and they get married. And the sad part of it was, is that she was a closet alcoholic, which when you're living with somebody doesn't stay in the closet very long. Okay? So yes, the story is told. And she had, I believe it's two children from a former marriage, which Stan embraced as his own. And so he and the old, cause they weren't little small children. At some point they sat her down and they said, Christina, we love you, but we're not going to live with the drinking. So the choice is yours. So she was at the choosing place, and she had people who loved her enough to point out the choosing place. And they said, you have to choose. It's us or the alcohol. Know that we love you, whatever you choose. But we aren't going to support this anymore. That's what love looks like. Mm -hmm. So fortunately for the story, she chose sobriety, and that's afterwards she wrote a book and the thirst for wholeness about her own journey and understanding why she drank to avoid what was within her and to try and seek a comfort that she hadn't been able to find as a, a youngster outside of herself. You know, so that's the choosing place, and. People don't understand. It can, you can zip past it in a blink, not realizing that you've even passed the choosing place, that there's that moment, there's that crossroads, where if you stop and breathe, and people who love us can point out the, the place when we're there and can say, it looks like you have a choice to make. And it's, it's not done with judgment. It's not done with anything but genuine clarity and, and usually love or genuine care compassion if it's a professional situation if a professional is advising a client or a patient or so the choosing place how powerful is that and so we're talking about power so the first mm -hmm. place we can get our power back is by recognizing the choosing place does this make sense yeah. Recognizing, recognizing that every day we have choices. It can be what we eat, what we wear, who we phone, how we write our report, how we conduct ourselves with our finances, in business, with our community. It can be, you know, so many ways. But in that moment, we choose. 
in the moment we can choose to the best of our ability, because sometimes we our unconscious sweeps us past it, okay? And all we can do is look back and go, oh, <laughs> I think back there I could have made a better decision, okay? But something inside of us <laughs> blows up. And, and then that's the learning, okay? No self-condemnation. You just pick yourself up and you know, no sitting in a puddle of self-pity because that doesn't solve the problem. It certainly doesn't empower us. Okay, if we need to have a, a boo-hoo about it, then that's just fine. Right. Sit down and have your boo-hoo. You know, if you need a shoulder to lean on, that's fine. You know, access what you need. Book a date with your therapist, whatever it is. Address it and do your self-care. Don't wallow in it. You've heard me say don't. Don't pitch your tent next to the sea of lost souls. And certainly don't take a swim in it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Winston Churchill says, when you're in hell, keep, when, you, when you're going oh through God. hell, keep going, right? <laughs> so you just, you just, you need to. It's okay to sit down on the path or and get your breath and get some support. That's totally 100% good, okay? But you don't pitch your tent there. You got to get up and keep going at some point, even if it's a little small step by step by step by step. Would you? I'm seeing your head going up and down. That means, yeah. 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 It, I think it underscores the relationship between meaning and power. Like someone, when you, when you, when you make a decision to use your personal power and some, it seems to me like you are beginning to ascribe meaning to that event in a way that's positive. Yes. <clears throat> Good point. So there's all of these life experiences that we have and what meaning do they have for us. And, um, you know, it's so profoundly deep how we can have all kinds of unconscious meanings attached to things. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> for those of you who are interested, volume one, yes. whole chapter on meaning. <laughs> and um, so we're back into power because I want to look at that one of the, we, we talk quite a bit about people who are taking power, misusing power, and the, uh, you know, the conversation about needing to have healthier boundaries and knowing ourselves and, and ethics and supervision and a colleague support, um, a community of, of transparency and conversation, recognizing when we're getting in deep water ethically and asking for help, recognizing when things are starting to go whoopsie daisy okay and and saying to a colleague you know what i think i i need to talk through what's going on here i can you know chapeau to many of my supervisors in my various trainings who were just simply wonderful in their advice and their directions and 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 their support in helping me and others understand how to negotiate things differently to get a better outcome because is that our intention is our intention to get the best for the higher good what's for the higher good here do i have my are, in, are my intentions wired to what's for the higher good for me and for others and so now we're going to look a little bit on the other side about you know Almost every day we're reading about situations in the field, you know, entheogens and psychedelics, okay, where there's problems. Now, this is a human problem. This isn't an entheogens and psychedelics problem. Let me just say that right out. This is a human problem. It doesn't matter what field you're in. There's going to always be challenges that come when people are interacting. We can agree on that. doesn't yeah. matter if you're an accountant, you're a dentist, you're a bus driver, it doesn't matter. There's there's always going to be challenges where people interact. And the more intimate that interaction is, the more delicate the ethics are. So if you have a situation where confidentiality is essential, you're a lawyer, you're a therapist, okay, you're a medical doctor. Yes, you have to share the files with the other specialists, let's say, but you know, that there's confidentiality there's a certain level of treatment so wherever there's the 
individual that you're working with, obviously a medical doctor who's looking at various parts of you is different from your accountant who's only looking in your, you know, your income tax return. But still, okay, there's, but do you understand what I'm saying? Like the Absolutely. deeper the level of, let's call it intimacy uh, between the individual and the, and the professional, then the, the more sensitive the ethics need to right. be around that and the moral standard. And never so more obvious in non-ordinary states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So whatever happens out in the everyday world is going to, again, be happening in non-ordinary states. The same ethical challenges, there's the same cha challenges around power, there's the same challenges around um, healthy boundaries. And so, uh, you know, for the on the professional side, for sure. And, and now let's look at the other side what can we learn about what's happening? You know, what can we learn about this? And I, I, I again, I want to give a little shout out to uh, Jill Evans because he's been writing about the difficult things. And he's yes. got the courage. Thank you, Jules. He's got the courage to write about the difficult things and the unpopular things that are happening that people don't really want to know about because we all want our special thing that we so feel so fabulous about we want it to be untainted by a human error well sadly there is human error so let's have a conversation about how to manage that and how to try and prevent it and how to try and reduce the the amount of it happening and the impact of it does does that make sense yeah it's it, I, I think that it underscores the idea of, of vulnerability and willingness to change comes from trying to tackle the difficult things. You know, that, that's where the change is. Yes. That's where the most profound, I mean, mm. we can have an encounter with good stuff. Sure. You know, my, my first, the first time I went in the ashram and my first yoga session is okay. I ate afterwards. It was half <laughs> the yoga and the meditation and the chanting. It was the whole nine yards. Okay. I had sore muscles and stuff from trying to do all these asanas that I never done before. But I went out empowered. Okay, I can breathe differently. And I feel differently when I breathe this way. And okay, I, it took me a while to learn, you know, the breath, the breathing techniques and the chanting. And it's like, wow. Okay, so it, all our experiences that we have in life offer the, us the opportunity, okay, for positive change. It's the difficult stuff that we just don't like. The Buddha nailed it. Life is difficult. We don't like that. We want life to be easy. Remember, simple and easy, two different things. Okay, but we want it to be easy. We want sunny days. We want the parking spot exactly where we want it when we pull up, you know, pull up in front of the, and we're running five minutes late on an appointment. You know, we want to win the lotto. We want people to love us. We want happiness. We want, I mean, it's even written into the American Constitution. <laughs> I, it, that's a whole other conversation if you're interested for another day because they should erase it they should take it out because it, or they should rewrite it so it's more clear for everybody that they focus on the pursuit of it right. the freedom to pursue it rather than it's my automatic right to be happy and you should be making me happy because it looks like that's how people have been, been interpreting it okay I have a right to be happy um <laughs> hello no <laughs> anyway okay back to power is why are there so many people finding themselves in this situation where they are giving their power away and why are we giving our power away what is that about and what can we learn about it what can we learn about how we hand over our power again give you a classic example classic classic female woman thing mm -hmm. okay? because the patriarchy is so hardwired into still our culture even though there's been great advances but we gotta say hey it's still there okay not so deeply or unconsciously and strongly as in other parts of the world other parts of the world still have patriarchy as the law <laughs> okay yeah. whereas we don't hear in let's say north america and western civilization but it's still deep in so you'll you'll get a married couple or a couple 
and the woman will hand over unconsciously hand over the power of her decisions unconsciously hand over the power to make decisions as far as family goes unconsciously hand hand over the power to do things okay and then often and sadly i, I used to see this in all the couple work i did often and sadly then be furious when the man does not or their partner let's say when their partner does not do what they think they should be doing hello, hello you handed your power over yeah. to that person to make your decision and now you're angry with them because they're not doing why don't you just take your power back and make your own decision and say listen i think this is the right thing to do and this is the reason why i feel it's the right thing to do you know but you still have women deeply following the patriarchy and when we get that, oh, giving away my power because I have some belief system inside of me that I should be doing this makes me unhappy and angry, and A, and B, it's so not fair to my partner. How is that fair to your partner if you hand their, your power over and then you're furious with them when they don't do what you want them to do? Why don't you just do what you want to do or at least discuss it? You know, does this make sense what I'm saying? But people handing yeah. over their power consciously or unconsciously? I, I think it, you could even extend it out to uh, like a authoritarian. Like I think for a lot of men too, and maybe all kids, maybe we're conditioned to respond to authority in a way that is unhealthy. Yes. That can be very healthy. Sure. That can be very healthy. And yet, if we're not careful, you know, I, I was raised as a young child. My, my father had been an, uh, an officer in, in the British Army and fought in the Second World War. And, and I was raised with that mentality as I was raised that you respect the people in uniform, you respect the police, that they're your friends and they're to help you if there's a problem and they give their lives to protect you. And I mean, because that's what my dad did, right? Yeah, sure. and, uh, you know, and uh, other people in, in our family and extended family had done and, and millions and millions and millions and millions of other men and young men and people had done and even women in the forces in the last number of decades. And, and so there's this training that you are taught to test, trust and count on your teachers and people in authority. And so that can be a deep training in which you know that training should have had an advisory with it mm -hmm. which is you know perhaps th that always trust your inner wisdom if something yeah. doesn't feel right yeah. we can't blindly trust yes if i if i see smoke and there's a fire and i call 911 i'm trusting that the fire engines will come because that's their deal. That's their commitment, right? If somebody goes into a psychedelic session, they are going to, depending on how they've set it up, they are going to assume that they are going to be well taken care of. Right? Yeah. And so we have this entrusting thing that we do, depending on how we've been raised. Some people don't trust anybody because they were raised don't trust. Right. Some people are too trusting because they were raised trust everything and everybody mm -hmm. in authority, you know. So how do we find our way past those belief systems? Because that's what they are. They're belief systems. We keep the good, which is, yes, if I call 911, an ambulance will come or a fire engine or what have you. And yes, as a whole, we should be able to count on the teachers in the classrooms and uh, to treat our children with respect and to teach them what they need to know and to have healthy boundaries with behavior around them, you know, and, um, and not find out that the science teacher is taking the young boys from grade nine to his cottage in the woods. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that actually happened when I was in high school. So, yeah. And I loved that science teacher. It was heartbreaking. Mm. He was brilliant. And if he just kept his activities somewhere else, <laughs> whatever, you know, he, if he'd honored, if he had honored his commitment to his profession. And, and so everybody has, we're back to the choosing place. 
he chose to dishonor his profession and himself and the trust the students put into him. And that's being repeated over and over again yeah. when hearing stories of the misuse and the abuse. And so I, I want to just help empower people on both sides. Empower, you know, as a Madrina of the Santo Dani Church, it's beholden on me to be a role model of our principles and our ethics. For goodness sake, I wrote that ethics code. Mm -hmm. If I can't abide by it, yeah. then, you know, somebody please mm -hmm. immediately bring it to my attention, you know? So on that side of it, we hold a power. Anybody in a position of authority has a power. Each time I serve somebody the sacrament, I feel accountable for them. And that's what has to, that's what has to be taken into consideration. The same way each time the doctor opens his door to receive a patient, accountable for what you do. Now, this is a high level of accountability. And we're going to have our good days and we're going to have our not so good days because we're human, right? But there's lines that can get crossed. Now, again, on the other side, as the patient, the client, the participant, what is our responsibility? And so I, we have a, a list that I wrote up that uh, as an advisory for external events. It's on our church website. Um, I copy pasted it into a post on why healers shouldn't be calling themselves healers. Okay. And, and, and you know, let's talk about that. And, and I'd love your thoughts on it. Sure. Because I hold people accountable to that they are responsible to do their due diligence about where they're going, who they're going to be with, what they're going to be taking. That that's on that's on us as the client, the patient, the and yes, something even if we do our due diligence and we go and see a therapist that we've heard really good things about and then he leans over and kisses us while we're talking about a three-year-old experience yeah that, that also happened to me too okay yeah yeah i did <laughs> i've got stories on stories on stories okay ask me if he stayed my therapist <laughs> ask me if i stood up got extremely angry and walked out okay now that's called the choosing moment that's when, wait a minute, I know this isn't right. This does not feel right, right for me. I know that there's something wrong here. Right. And and what do I choose to do now in this moment? And taking the moment and taking the breath and understanding deeply how important it is to our own souls that in that moment we are, we are practicing self-care and inner wisdom. And that if we're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, what's for our higher good, we're actually doing for what's the higher good of the other person. Isn't that difficult, though, for someone who's in a vulnerable position to be that yes. aware of themselves? Yes, yes, <laughs> that, yes. That's why we need guidelines. That's why we need screening. That's why we need these conversations. Yeah. People have to understand you're going into a non-ordinary state of consciousness. You will be sensitive. Yes. You will feel more vulnerable. You will. Okay, what I loved about Stan Groff is he had, because in, in the training in holotropic breathwork, we had what was called the stop. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and, and that was the word that was used. If anybody assisting you in the moment, in your process, if something didn't feel right, you just said stop and everything stopped. Okay, I mean, unless for your own safety that someone was preventing you from bashing yourself into a wall, okay? <laughs> you know, there's moments when it's explained, if it's for your own safety or the safety for others, then we'll stop, but we need to explain to you why we're doing this. This is for your, you know, for your well-being. So if you're screaming, don't do this, I hate this, go away, leave me alone, it's all part of your process. The minute you say stop, that's you saying stop how you're supporting my process we need to readjust okay because the the, the body work and breath work is people touching you you know and that whole conversation about yeah, touch yeah. has to happen 
that whole conversation about touch, you know, in our church, it's very clear. We have complete guidelines. We don't touch people unless it's for their own safety or well-being. They're about to fall off the chair. Yeah, we're going to be grabbing you <laughs> before you hit the floor. Okay. And, and you know, uh, or if you're starting to purge, cleanse, or what have you, yes, we might touch you so that you don't throw up on yourself. Okay. And so we're, you know, this is, we give very clear guidelines. We won't touch you unless it's for your health and safety or the health and safety of others, um, or unless you ask us to. Or if we go to touch you, we're going to check in, may I touch you? You know, may I help you get up? May I help you lie down? Okay. And so there's these guidelines that are there that are hopefully help. Now, if someone doesn't like it and doesn't say anything, you know, well, that becomes a different conversation, which is we gave you the opportunity. Can we help you understand why in that moment you felt you couldn't? You know, and that's just a really deep conversation to be had where both people need to take responsibility for what was happening, you know, and, and find a way to go forward with um, what will be for the higher good and for the transform positive transformation um, of the parties involved. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, you can, you know, if, if, if you look at it, the way in which a, a, a practicing doctor, you don't, let, you don't let someone who's only gone through the text part of medical school do an operation. <laughs> Right? No. You don't want that person there. I mean, hey, I, there, but not the I looked at the diagrams. I've washed my hands. <laughs> I think I can do this. I think my sample <laughs> is sharp. <laughs> you know, I understand emergency field stuff. Okay, right. you're out in a war, in the first world war, second world war, whatever it is. You're out in the the woods and the trench and stuff like that but people do what they can do to try sure. and help you know i'm just going to dig this bullet out of you buddy okay so but in today's world and you know in today's world then no one should be you know if you are practicing if you are doing things and practicing things and you're not trained or you're not credentialed or you're not licensed i think it's time to sit down and ask yourself what you're doing and why you're doing it like who am i doing this for why am i doing mm. this what is my motivation here what meaning does this have for me and if i'm really sincere like i can't even count i can't even count how many people come in and drink dime with us and they say i'm going back to school and they go off and they do a master's in whatever it is they feel called to do, or they do doctorate, okay? But they go back and get some extra training. It's like Danny shows up, woohoo, <laughs> you know, back to school. And they say, oh my God, I'm like, you know, however old they are. I was, so I don't have much much sympathy because I have compassion, not much sympathy. Because it's like, hey, Danny sent me back to school when I was 60. And I, <laughs> when Danny showed me this, I went, ha, 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 you got to be joking, right? <laughs> like, am I the eternal student? Am I... Forever mm -hmm. going to be writing papers. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're going back to school, girl. <laughs> okay, okay. So, if for our if our inner wisdom lets us know, and we're not listening to that inner wisdom, what's going on, Lord? What's going on? What's happening there? Okay. If inner wisdom is telling us, okay, something's not right there. You've suggested that maybe they have an internal trauma. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm talking on the patient, client, participant side of things now, okay? Maybe they've had a trauma that they feel they can't speak up. Okay, we can understand that. That some point in their life, probably very young, whether it was in the home or in this culture, out on the street, you know, or in the schoolyard, all of us, I think, are most, if not all of us, had difficult experiences at one time. You know, this is again Buddhism. There's no one escapes illness or suffering. So everyone can point to some things that happened that were painful or difficult or challenging. And again, the human species being what it is, does anybody get out through the school years without being bullied in some way or teased in some way or made fun of or criticized or cast out of the clique because you don't have fill in the blank these right. days it would be the latest iphone right 
that it used to be how you wore your hair and the clothes you wore or whatever, what your parents did or how you spoke or if you wore glasses or needed hearing aids or whatever it was, boy, it would be, it would be taken out on you, you know? And so how do you get through all of that understanding that it's not personal? Mm. That's the first piece. Personal. It's just the human species doing its thing, right? And it's not personal. And 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 then, so how do we transform that as an adult to say the things that I've let affect me and create belief systems about who I am in the world that's making me now in this moment when some part of my inner wisdom is telling me that this is wonderful for me, therefore go forward. Or wait a minute, red light, red light. Okay, something happened here that you know is not right. Okay, why am I going along with it? When are getting up and saying, uh uh, and walking out? There's no condemnation, there's no judgment here. There's none. There's just an interest, a curiosity. Is how can we address that? The choosing place to help people find it and choose what's for their higher good. How do we how do we support that so that people realize I don't have to? You know, the Me Too movement helped a lot uh, for women for sure to come out of the closet and say, mm -mm, "Yeah, I had a boss just like that, or a teacher, or a what have you, or a colleague." But in the field that we're working in, how, how do we empower people so that they find their voice, they speak up, and they get supported? Maybe we can't. Maybe like this is a, this is just throwing this out there for the sake of a conversation. Like maybe it's necessary. Maybe it has to happen to you before you can begin to find your voice. Maybe there has to be this point of resistance. And I, I don't wish anything like that on people, but very level, good right? very good very good <laughs> yay you know these things are hard to talk about yes and they're 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 hard to take you know to take in you know what's that story from is it a conversation with god and and there's a group of, of souls waiting to incarnate and, and one soul says Hey, I want to go back to planet Earth and I want to learn how to forgive. Like forgiveness is going to be an issue. And then, okay, but you have to have something happen that you have to forgive. <laughs> well, <laughs> and anybody volunteering? <laughs> okay. Another soul puts up their hand and says, "Well, okay, I I I'll do something that you have to forgive, but you have to promise me when I'm doing it that you remember it's me and that we have this agreement that." <laughs> I'm going to do this, you know, yeah. right? And so yeah. there's that school of thought. It's right. a school of thought that there's some karmic, you know, what you yeah. were speaking about. Let's talk, at, talk about a karmic preset, the karmic patterns, mm. okay, in which the karmic pattern, and again, volume one, I write a, a lot about karma and karmic presets and looking and uh, trying to, you know, getting a, a, some maps as to understand the patterns that we have in our life. Does this come from past lives? Does this come from yeah. my childhood? Does this come from now? Does this come from my belief systems? What meaning does this have? How do I empower myself? You know, so if somehow in my karma, now this difficult situation is coming around and, and this has happened, what do I get to learn in this? Mm -hmm. what, do, what, what are my teachings and what do I get to learn? And the sooner I learn, to, to recognize the choosing place because a lot of times that's the deepest teaching you know stuff happens that we have absolutely no control over right. you know that's the serenity prayer right grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change the courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference so lots of things happen to us that affect our lives. With, and we may have had no role in it. All of a sudden, we're minding our own business and bombs are dropping. Yeah. If we're opening our store or our daycare or we're taking our kid to daycare or we're stopping off to have breakfast and get our cup of coffee or whatever it is at our favorite little restaurant. And all of a sudden, 
things that we knew, didn't know about that we have no hand in that is in the bombs dropping. Okay, what's the choosing place there? The choosing place is how do I take care of myself? How do I survive? How do I? So we go right back down into survival there. It's not a time to do anything else but try and navigate through those. But those are extreme difficult situations. I mean, you know, every day people have challenges of how to manage this. So the best can come out of it for me and for others. So how do we, you know, I love what you're bringing up because it brings us to the little demons. Yeah, totally. <laughs> How many of us have ever wanted, you know, some of my personal favorite demons, however, how many of us have wanted revenge? Mm, all of us. Yeah. All of us, <laughs> We're hardwired for the, mm. okay, <clears throat> you threw a rock at me, I'm throwing a rock at you. Mm. What did Gandhi say? If we follow an eye for an eye, the world right. will find the world will be blind okay so we're all these little you know some of them are character flaws and other sure. things we're kind of hard hardwired for them and so we have to look at these kind of urges impulses little demons whatever we call them and understand that we have them but do we let them make our decisions for us the urge to take revenge when somebody does something, you know, wrong, wrong to us. Mm. There's a wonderful story of, I believe it's uh, Pope John Paul II. Remember, there's a young man who shot him, mm. shot him in the shoulder. Okay. <clears throat> the first thing he did when he got out of hospital was he wanted to go to the prison and visit the young man. And he said, I'm, I'm here to pray with you. I want, I want to forgive you. I, I, can I pray with you? And a lot of people misunderstand forgiveness. Okay, Forgiveness doesn't become, mean they became best friends. Right. <laughs> forgiveness means that he was living his teachings. He was living his principles. He was living his beliefs. Okay? I don't want to take revenge on you. Right. I want to forgive you. A good example of what's possible. So how, how that again, we're at the choosing place. Do I take revenge? Or do I choose to stop and think what's for the higher good? <clears throat> Jealousy. Another little, lovely little thing hmm. <laughs> that we all have. Yeah. Okay. That we can feed that one. Oh, that can be a really hungry. It can sit in a high chair with its yeah. mouth open like a baby bird in a nest and tweet, 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 <laughs> feed me. Can be another, you know. <laughs> so there, there's so many of these, you know, aspects of being human that we we all share them. We, you know, jealousy, envy, you know, um, you know revenge, uh, all of these things. We all have the potential for them. You know, and you know this dance of power that exists between all of us. There's a dance of power that exists between all of us. There's always people in authority over us, and and we will always have some authority over someone else, whether it's our children, whether it's the kids in our classroom, whether it's the congregation in our church, whatever it is. And we're always in that dance with it. And, and, and how do we find wholeness? How do we find transparency? How do we, how do we learn about the choosing place, the place, that moment where we can choose? And so back to the list that we have up that I hope to encourage people to, you know, and, and maybe it is part of their karma that they don't bother to look up where they're going and who they're, going to be there maybe that's part of their karma that they have this you know everybody's having this amazing mm. experience and i want one and mm. i'm going to clatter off to the nearest amazing experience then what do i get to learn about myself so it isn't just about pointing the finger um there was a big conversation and uh, jack cornfield i have to you know chapeau thank you 
um, mm-hmm. being a, a great teacher for me in his book, you know, after the FC, the laundry. And he talked about, he talks about, he would talk about it in person uh, when we were in retreats, uh, when he was doing his teaching and he would, and he's written about it, about both sides have to take responsibility. Yeah. And he would say, look at all the ethical problems that have happened. You know, there was, there was a Buddhist teacher who was a closet alcoholic. There was a, another one who was, um, you know, having sexual encounters with, with the disciples or with the, you know, the group. And, and it, it, you can point to him, you can see. And, and he says, yeah, but are we taking, aren't we forgetting something? We have to take responsibility. I watched a, a Pedrino of a large Brazilian church who started traveling throughout North America. And certainly I didn't see it here in Canada. I saw it and certainly didn't have it in my church. But um, what I saw was that he started traveling alone. Big mistake. That's mm. the first mistake. Okay. And, and, and basically people were throwing wine, women, and song at him. Okay. And, and this was Jack Cornfield's position which is we have to take ownership of what we do on our side. Do we hand our power over to people? Do we treat them? Do we project our higher self onto them and then expect them to be the all encompassing, all loving mummy daddy, authority mm-hmm. figure, God, goddess that we've longed for. That's very unfair to, to ourselves, but it's super unfair to the authority figure too. Yeah. Okay? And and so the on the side of responsible authoritarianism, you have to have everything in place to guard impeccability, responsibility, and ethics. On the participant side, you have to pay attention that that we as participants, students, are not doing anything that is co-creating. You know, remember that wonderful film. Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. The girl okay, I mean, he's just great in those yeah. wonderful action films. Okay, do you remember? There's one scene. It's I believe it's in the first film, and there's one scene where he's in the classroom and this kind of dusty, fusty. You know, uh, he's a professor in the in the class teaching archaeology, and 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 he and he kind of looks strangely at, a, at one of the young women. And she closes her eyes, and she's written on it, "Love you." <laughs> <laughs> And I have a lot of colleagues in academia, and and I myself have been in situations where you can see, and even in my private practice, where people are approaching you with charm, mm-hmm. they're approaching you with flattery, they're approaching you with kind of sexual seductive vibrations, mm-hmm. and we need to take ownership of that. Okay, we need to. We just need to own it. What we're doing on our side. Yeah. Okay? Is yes. On the other side, the person in authority has to take responsibility for falling into those traps because it can be very seductive. Remember the story of of Siddhartha. He said, Mm. what does marriage, I I always love this. Can we talk about this for a couple of minutes? Please, absolutely. How the the temptations that Jesus had were different from the ones that Buddha had. Don't you find that fascinating? It's like Darkness, Mara, the devil, okay, the tempter, whatever you're going to try. Now, that, that, that plays a very strong role. We have to tip our hat to the dark side that they are only doing what they've been commissioned to do, okay? And, and But isn't it interesting what they got tempted on? They both got tempted on power, okay? So what, what does the, you know, uh, Jesus has been fasting, and what does, what does Satan come and, t- and tempt him with? He takes him up to the mountain. He's like, this could all be yours. Would you, wouldn't you like to have all of this over here? You know, all you got to do is say the word. Power, power, just say the word and it's all yours. <laughs> right. Woo, what a trap to fall in. Who wouldn't love that? Okay. That's like the Matrix film when he says, plug me back in, but give me a good yeah. life. I'd be like a Hollywood producer or something. Big house, and big car and stuff. Okay, Doesn't Siddhartha so- get to he gets to experience it a little bit though when he goes through the idea of being a merchant? Like he get, kind of gets to a, a, he gets to experience having the power in a, in a in a different sort of way. 
Yes, but let's just stay with the moment okay. of faith. <laughs> okay. Okay, because I find it really interesting. So, okay, so Jesus gets the power thing, okay? Mm-hmm. And then what does he get when that doesn't work? He gets the, you're hungry, you didn't eat. Okay, so he mm-hmm. gets the, the you know, it, it, survival thing, you mm-hmm. know? Like faith. Mm-hmm. But it's, again, it's a tricky thing because it's trying to reach him through hunger, but it's still about power. Mm-hmm. You can turn these stones into bread mm-hmm. and you can eat. Yeah, but if I can turn them into bread, then I can turn them into honey. Mm. I can turn it into gold, and I can turn it into hay. So it's still about power. It's just the first one didn't work, so now it's trying another way of getting in, right? Until finally he gets fed up. Okay, so those are, I think, the two big ones that he's tested on. And finally gets fed up and says, oh, get behind me. Now, you have to ask yourself, it's very interesting. What does he mean by get behind me? Yeah, we, we should have Dr. David on for a conversation. I know. He, he yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, get him. We'll, we'll get him. We'll get him. We'll try and we'll try and sort that out in the future. Okay. What yeah, does he absolutely. actually mean by get behind me? Do you really want someone who's tricking you to get behind you? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you rather have them in front of you? Or like what is that part of the story about? That's always fascinated when he says get behind me. Yeah. You know, the meaning that I have put to it, not mm-hmm wanting to suggest that this is the ultimate meaning of what he was saying because a i wasn't there okay so i don't know he's not here so i can't ask him christ consciousness yes lives inside of me but that's christ consciousness that's not jesus the manifesting as a human being okay so how i understood that is that he didn't want temptation between him and his destiny path he wanted the path clear in front of him Mm -hmm. he was walking forward and he didn't want any obstacles or temptations in front of him on the path yeah so when he said get behind me it's like we're done here Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay we're done here go go we're done i'm walking my path and nothing that you're going to try and pull me off the path is going to work so get behind me i don't fear you nothing you can do to get me all trembly and stop on the yeah. path. Yeah. Okay. And so just get behind me. Anyway, that's how I interpret it. If it's helpful to anybody else, I am super glad. Okay. So back to Buddha. What did he get tempted? From? Well, according to the stories, okay. And this opens a whole other conversation mm-hmm. too. Um, yeah, but about why wasn't Jesus tempted on that? Okay. So um, uh, what was Buddha tempted on? Do you remember? Well, I remember when he came upon lust and he saw a woman bathing, and then that was beautiful the, I, women, beautiful yeah, women who was right. tempted on lust. Okay, because he, he, I believe, was celibate, right? Yeah. And although, although, although nowhere in the scriptures does it say, nowhere anywhere does it say that Jesus was celibate. So everybody knows that a rabbi would have been married, right? And had lots of children, right? Okay, that that was the norm, okay, for a rabbi to be married. That can we kind of guess that maybe he didn't get tempted on that because he was half married? <laughs> <laughs> That's no big. Don't bother testing me on that. Yeah. Anyway, just a theory. Please don't anybody take me to task over this. It's just a thought and it's just a theory. Okay, I'll call so David maybe- Solomon right now. <laughs> 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 okay okay I'll have a oh no so um so so here's poor buddha he gets tempted he gets tempted <laughs> on food he gets so this is a right. common one to get tempted through the body mm-hmm. through the body and its its needs okay he gets tempted on food he gets tempted on power he gets tempted on lust on on beautiful women okay and then he gets tempted on fear okay mm-hmm. Mar- appears to him as a huge dark being and says you're an illusion too okay so there's just those little bit of differences of temptations but if we use that as for all of us that these guys had to face temptations challenges difficult times right of course we are going to of course we're going to how it's as if you know you have children uh, it's not different from having children. Do you know how children from almost from birth know all the cracks in your armor? It's like a radar that children have. 
for yeah. example, all your weak points. It's as if they can, before they can talk, they already know exactly how to get you. Have you noticed that mm -hmm. about children? Yeah. I'm, yeah, you know, course. a mother and my grandmother. And, 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 and so we have to accept that our flaws are evident to everyone around us. Okay. And even to tiny young children that they can see them. And so aren't we then beholden to take responsibility for them? And how can we do that with a sense of humor? How can we do that taking responsibility? How can we do that knowing that we're going to fail a few tests from time to time and that we're going to dust ourselves off and we're going to pick ourselves up and we're going to keep on walking on the path. <clears throat> and so both sides need to take responsibility. We all have to take responsibility for our decisions and for our choosing. And then for the consequences of our choosing. Okay, this happened. These were the consequences. Now, how do I manage that for my higher good, for my health, my well-being, my higher good? What is the best thing that I can do that is going to help me and then hopefully maybe my family or others, my community, so speaking up, so people who, you know, we can chapeau to be a dear friend, who throughout the decades I've known her has been willing to face on the difficult issues and talk about them and write about them. And, and other people in the field who are, um, are trying to address the difficult things. And have you noticed how when you try and do that, that you're often you know, judged and criticized. Sure. And so it's an interesting moment in the field. And if we all take part and in, in, in the dance that we're in and learn to understand ourselves better, then I think that we can make the dance better. Yeah. It, maybe the... You know, we often hear that idea that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. But maybe every time we become better dancers, maybe we're practicing the dance, and this time we don't fall during the dip. <laughs> yeah. And, we, and look at how much we have to practice over and over and yes. over things that yeah. we're learning. You know, yeah. whether we're, you know, in grade one and we're learning to write the alphabet, how many times do we write it until we get a decent enough right. alphabet going? You know, the times table, two times two is four, et cetera. And so we're, we're always learning. The learning process in life never ends. And uh, we're learning up to our last breath. We're learning about things. So I just want to do a quick review on, um, you know, eye on the clock and knowing that we'll need to wrap up for today. And um, it's always a joy to visit with you. And so just to anybody out there listening, whatever you decide to participate in, take the time, please to ensure your own well-being. Take the time, if you're booking yourself in to go off to some event or some retreat somewhere, please do all your, it's called due diligence. Look into the facts. Who, what is the organization? Who's running it? What are their credentials and their training? You have the right to ask those questions. Really, you have the right to, and you should be asking for your own health yeah. and well-being. What will they be serving? Exactly what will they be serving? What strengths are they serving? Who prepares you? What does the preparation look like? What is the aftercare or integration or follow-up? Do they provide material for you? Is there... Uh, a community event that you can participate. You know, our church has, we have information sessions and we have uh, hymn practices and we have events that people can join in and to ask questions and learn more. You know, we have a resource list uh, for people who find some difficulty. We've got a resource list of who they can contact for specific help. Some people aren't going to need to go into therapy after they've drunk a few times. They even need therapy and we're not a therapeutic center. We're we say we pray and we meditate, you know. 
And so what are you taking? How much are you taking? You know, and, and what are their beliefs? What are they actually going to be doing in the ritual? It just blows me away that people go off and do these things. Oh, I'm going to be taking this. And I say, yeah, but what's the ritual? What's mm. the procedure? Mm. And what are the belief systems or the principles of the center? You know, you go on our church website, the principles are there, the the code of ethics is there, the visitor screening is there, the history of our practice is there, the links to hymns or videos or whatever, it's all there. This is what you're going to get, okay? And, And so you have to ask those questions. And if people are not asking those questions or if they're not getting good answers, I can't believe how many, you know, all these, um, I was speaking with somebody just yesterday um, who who is hoping to do documentary and, and, you know, peel down through the layers until they they found me in our church or my website and what have you, and and was thrilled to find that. They said they could not believe how many, I'm going to call them hybrid ayahuasca or hybrid medicine, plant medicine circles, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and these hybrid circles, um, it's, it's the name I've been calling them out of respect because I don't know what people are doing in them. I don't want to be disrespectful because I don't know, you know. And, and this, this individual said, I, I found so many people. And they have no training. They have no certification. They have no science. They have no nothing to show me. And he says, and I came across you. You have all this science. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, thank God. You know, that science and spirituality, it has to meet. And so folks out there, ask your questions. And that is how you keep your power. And if you are booking into something and they cannot answer you, they cannot tell you what they believe, they cannot say, oh, yes, please, here we have this book or this pamphlet or this, please, on our website, if you go to that, then you can read about our principles, you can read about our code of ethics. If they can't do that for you, then you have to ask yourself why you're going. Does does this make sense? Yes? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you have questions, you should be seeking answers. And why would you go to someone who has more questions than you have? You know, on, on some level, you're. it comes down to principles. It comes down to the why. Why do I want to do this? Why am I doing this? Yeah, right. Why am I doing this? Right. Why am I doing this? Because my friends did and they had a fabulous time. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Listen, you have a friend who sees a fabulous movie and they come back and say, man, you got to go see this movie. It's fantastic. Okay. Or they try, they find a new restaurant and they say, you know what? Every, everything on the menu was amazing. Okay. And the service was terrific. Well, sure. You know, you want to go and try, right? Yeah. But there's a big difference between going to a new rest restaurant and going to see a movie and going into a very vulnerable, non-ordinary state of consciousness during which there is a good chance you will not be able to take care of yourself in the way that you can in the ordinary state of consciousness. Yeah, I think... And so the general sure. rules, yeah. the general rules of be mindful of what you're doing becomes yeah. even more important in the non-ordinary states. Well, it's been a joy. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you. I wish you peace and health and happiness until the next time. <laughs> and may wisdom continue to grow and blossom in your soul. Uh, may the divine light always guide and protect you. And may you and your loved ones be in health and at peace. So wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, what more could you possibly add to that? Thank you so much, everybody who's listening and took part in our conversation. And I I want to say thanks again for, for your time and, and your thoughts and your wisdom and the books, Ayahuasca Awakening. Everyone who's interested in this conversation, please check out the two guidebooks that she's that, that she has written. Go to the new website. It's phenomenal. The links will be down in the show notes. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a beautiful day. That's all we got for today. Aloha. Thank you. Always fun. Yes. Always a great.